Thanks for joining Castleview Baptist Church in our online service. It's our mission to lead people into a thriving relationship with Jesus. We hope this service transforms you, uplifts you, and empowers you to be all that you can be through the grace of Jesus Christ. Well, you have chosen a great day to be here. And uh, if you were here in the Sunday school hour already, you know that. And by the way, let me just put a little plug in. Uh, we're going to have food trucks in a few moments. We're looking forward to some great food, some great fellowship. And then right after we eat, we've got one more service uh, that's going to be right around 1 o'clock. So just when we finish, uh, we'll come back in here. You'll want to be here for that as well because Dr. David Young will be preaching again. He's been a blessing already. Uh, one of my favorite Bible preachers, in all the, and I mean that in all sincerity, we do give each other a hard time. Uh, there's a lot of jokes that kind of go back and forth. Uh, he's kind of a mean-spirited person when you get to know him. Uh, however, and I truly mean this, uh, one of the most consistent, faithful families that we have ever had the privilege of being friends with have been these two sitting right here. We've known him a long time. He's been traveling since, I guess you would have started about 1988. Is that right? Uh, was it 88, 89? A little bit later than that? 58, 59? Uh, was it, when did you graduate from, oh, you know what? Not 88. I'm sorry. You graduated. Was it 93? 92. Boy. All right. I blew it on that one, didn't I? Oh, I was thinking 88, all that gray in your goatee threw me off. Uh, I was a youth pastor in North Carolina. We actually invited them to come. It was the first chance to get to know them. And uh, we st struck it off right away. We've been friends ever since. It's been a long time. And I appreciate their faithfulness, their consistency. I love his good Bible preaching. When you hear Dr. Dave Young preach, you're going you're gonna to walk away. You're going to either say, hey, I love that. I hated that. One thing you will not say is that, you know what, he didn't give me the Bible today. You cannot say that. You're going you're to hear what the Bible uh, is telling you. Uh, I told our men, Brother Dave, uh, this really meant a lot to me. We've had our men's groups meeting here, and uh, we've been talking about the inner life and encouraging and have for friends and these kind of things. And uh, I told them about a text you sent me about a year ago or so. And uh, the text just said this. He said, hey, uh, he said, how are you doing? And he said, and I don't mean your church. How are you? I had to think about that. that. That wasn't a quick text back because people don't usually ask that. And when they ask me how I'm doing, I text back how the church is doing. Uh, oh, man, church is doing great. I'm awesome. You know, hey, we've had some good days where things are going. You know, things have not been going so hot. You know, I'm not doing too well. And he said, no, no, how, how are you doing? What's going on in the inner life? How's your purity? How's your walk with God? Listen, if you've got a friend in your life like that, you've got a true friend. And I'm thankful that I get to introduce a dear friend of ours this morning, Brother David Young. You're going to enjoy him. Make sure you listen well, open your Bible, open your heart, and listen to what the Word of God has to say through our messenger this morning. Would you come this morning? Thank you for being here. All right, Pastor, thank you. Good morning, church family. I am uh, so happy to be in Colorado. Uh, where am I? Castle Rock. And uh, that's where I am. But uh, so happy to be here this morning. And uh, I sure am thankful for a great service so far, aren't you? And the music was amazing. And I always love, I always just love being in different churches. And this is just incredible. I remember when y'all started. And uh, just to see God's blessings and favor just warms my heart. And I do love Brother Tate. And I'm so thankful for our friendship. Belt and I said last night after we spent some time at their home, we said, you know, the Thronsons are friends of ours that no matter how long it's been, we always walk in and pick up right where we left off and uh, it goes downhill from there. And uh, <laughs> but, uh, we always have a blast. And uh, God bless all of you. Now help me to know the crowd a little bit because it's a Family Matters conference uh, today. And uh, so let me help, help me know the crowd. First of all, how many of you are here this morning because this is your church family? How many of you are like that? That'd be most of you. Let me see your hand. Good night. And uh, okay, a lot of you. Now how many of you are like me? Uh, you're here today, but this is not your church family. You're a guest in the service. How many of you are like that today? Let me see your hands. And quite a few of you around the building. And I'm honored uh, you ought to come back and hear uh, Pastor Thronson. And I hope you will if you haven't already. Uh, how many of you then are married? Let me see your hand. If you have a spouse, let me see your hand. All right. How many of you are happily married? Do like this. All right. Okay. Most of you. <laughs> I'll help the rest of you. Um, how many of you are not married? That should be everybody else. How many of you are not married? Let me see your hand. Okay. Just one more question along that line. How many of you are not married, but you plan to change that? Anybody here? 
Anybody? A few young people, even some older folks. That's great. That'll work. Uh, one, word or, one or two more things here. How many of you have a family? You have children. Let me see your hand. You have children. How many of y'all liking that? Isn't that great? Huh? And yeah, your children are great. How many of you have grandchildren? Raise that hand good and high. How many of y'all like your grandchildren better than your children? Uh, yeah, I could see that. That kind of works that way, doesn't it? Uh, I stayed with this couple one time and uh, I was spending the night in their house and the, the back of their car said, let me tell you about my, ask me about my grandchildren. I learned a valuable lesson that night. Don't do it. And because uh, they'll show you pictures and tell you stories. It took a long time, but uh, God bless you no matter where you are, no matter where you are in life, married, single, all is well, things are not so well. I'm really excited to teach you God's word this morning. We're talking about the family and I'm titling today winning at home. So let's talk about winning at home. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. So I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And I'll give you a moment to get there. And while you're turning, let me introduce my family to you. All right. So I got a picture for you here of my family. There's the young family. My best friend and my girlfriend and my favorite person in all the world is right here at the front. This is my sweetheart. We've been married 28 years next month. And I met one lady in the building said next month on the 23rd, they'll be married 61 years. And uh, so I said, you might as well stay married. Uh, this might as well stick it out. You're doing pretty good, I think. But here's Bethley and I, and there we are. And our little one, Charity, our, our eighth grader, the baby of our families right here by her mom. And then here's our oldest, Abigail and her husband, David, our uh, on staff at West Coast Baptist College in Lancaster, California. Joshua and Bethany, uh, right here next to mom. He's a youth pastor in Camarillo, California at Horizon Baptist Church. Right here is Matthew on the end. He's getting married Saturday to that lady there beside him. And uh, he's a youth pastor in Odenville, Alabama. I'm coast to coast. We got the Southerners and the Californians in the family. And then here's Jacob. He's actually headed to Bible college in a few days. Uh, next month, actually, about four weeks from now, he'll be headed to Bible college, and he wants to be a music pastor and a youth pastor, and uh, this is the young family. Don't, don't I have a good-looking family? And uh, the Lord's sure been good to me. A couple other things to tell you about. We have a podcast, and I don't know if you podcast or whatever, but uh, throw that up there for us. We got a podcast called Keeping It Young. I came up with that myself. That's, we're the Dave Young family, Keeping It Young, and uh, so if you'd like to tune in every Monday morning, you'll find us on any podcast. Um, Basically, it's, we, we cover most of the podcast sites, Keeping It Young podcast, and uh, then here's a couple other items just about our ministry, and sometimes along the way, I preach in a couple's conference or a family's conference, and people have questions, but feel awkward about asking it in person, and uh, you have a wonderful pastor, and, and I would recommend you go to him, but if it's a, something I can help you with, Dave at evangelistdaveyoung.com is my email. And uh, you write me, and if I can help you, I'd be glad to do so. Uh, I don't typically counsel with ladies, but I have a wonderful wife. And if you ladies write me, I'll see that she gets it. And uh, she would be, we'd be happy to help you if we can. It would be our honor to do so. All right, let's jump in. We're talking about winning at home today. How many of y'all like to win? Uh, y'all like to win? How many of y'all like to win? Be honest about that. How many of y'all like to uh, win in comebacks? You know what I mean by that? Anybody here good at comebacks? I mean, they can zing you right back. Somebody sent me a meme the other day that said, uh, here's a good comeback. It said, maybe you should eat some makeup so you can be pretty on the inside too. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that, that was pretty rough, wasn't it? Some people are pretty good at, they have a lot of victory at comebacks. Others uh, have victory in arguing. How many of y'all like to win an argument? Anybody here? How many, how many have somebody in your family and they always have to have the last word? How many of y'all know somebody like that? And so we like to win. We like victory in arguing. If you were in the morning service, I told the, the folks in the 930 hour that I read somewhere that arguing with your wife is like reading the software agreement on your computer. You have no idea what it's about, so you're just best to click, I agree. And uh, there may be some truth of that. Somebody sent me a meme that said the difference in buying a lottery ticket and in arguing with your wife is that you have a chance of winning one of them. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty bad, don't y'all think? Victory in sports. How many of y'all like winning at sports? Any, any Bronco fans in the building? Any Denver Broncos fans? Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Broncos fan, but I grew up in Tennessee, and the reason I'm a Broncos fan is because of Peyton Manning, and uh, that's what turned me to be a Denver Bronco fan. So I'm a Tennessean by birth, and I'm a Tennessee volunteer fan. We got a guest here this morning from Arkansas, but we won't hold that against y'all. Well, we're glad y'all are here anyway, those Razorbacks. 
But uh, I like the big orange. I like to win. I like to win. My son is an Alabama Roll Tide fan. I said, son, I'm a failure as a dad when, when my son becomes a... But he said, dad, I like to win. That's why I, I chose Alabama. So well, I can't argue with that. Uh, victory. There's something about victory and finishing, isn't there? Like every, how many of y'all remember taking algebra? How many of y'all remember? How many of y'all thank God you're done with that? There's just victory and getting done, isn't there? So victory is a wonderful word. One of the greatest victories you will ever win is to win at home. One of the greatest victories in life is to win at home. And my heart today is to just give you some challenge, some encouragement about winning at home. So if you were with us in the first hour, we basically in the first hour, I think I even threw the screen up there, didn't I? I put a, put a, a note in there about the first hour. Let me see that one. Uh, winning at home. What was our first thought? How did I title that? Embracing responsibilities. That was what we talked about. How many of y'all remember that? How many were in the first hour? Love and lead if you're a husband. Remember that? A partner in respect if you're a lady. Obey and honor if you're children. Now this hour, I want to talk to you uh, not just about performing great responsibilities, but pursuing a great marriage. I believe in marriage. Do y'all believe in marriage? You know, we live in a culture that does not. Our culture thinks that romance is found in a dating relationship. Our culture thinks that romance is found in living together. But are you aware of the fact that biblical romance is found in a marriage? And there's nothing quite like having a wonderful marriage. Everybody in this room, if you're married, you ought to aspire to have a great marriage. And if you're not married, then you ought to listen carefully today. Because number one, if you get married, you ought to get started on the right foot. And if you never get married, you ought to always be pro-marriage. We ought to be pro-marriage. And so here's what the Bible says in Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5 and verse 31, the Bible says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, notice how simple that is, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. How simple is that? For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Just by way of introduction, think about that verse for a moment. There's God's definition of marriage. It's one man, one woman, for one life. That's God's definition. Now you know that God's definition is not always lived, not even in the church. Because all kinds of things happen in a marriage. Many of you in this room this morning have been through a divorce, haven't you? You, you've struggled. Some of you may be in your third marriage. That, that's not uncommon in our culture, but it does not change. No matter our experiences, it doesn't change God's ideal. And God's definition shows God's ideal. And the ideal God has for your marriage is that it's one man who marries one woman and they're married the rest of their life. And you grow and you work on it. And when you come to the end of your life, you are madly in love and happily married and all is well. That's God's plan. You see, yeah, but you know, we've already blown God's plan. Well, I just got to tell you, uh, God knows where you are, and God is always able to give us a new beginning. How many of y'all praise God for that? You can always have a new beginning, and God, God will work. If you're married, I'm telling you, God's plan is for you to stay married and work on that marriage. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, there's something about the permanence of marriage. God intends it to last. My dad's a Tennessean. He's a country fella. And one day my dad said to us kids, he said, now look, kids, just want y'all to know something. If your mother ever leaves me, I'm going with her. <laughs> now, that was a weird way of saying it. And, and you know that doesn't always work that way. But the fact of the matter is, what my dad was trying to let us kids know was, Mom and I intend for this to work. How many of you married folks know that no good marriage occurs by accident? How many of y'all know that if you're married? Is that not right? It takes a lot of work to have a great marriage, doesn't it? it? takes a lot of prayer. You praying about it? When's the last time you prayed for your spouse? By name. I mean, for crying out loud, she's married to you, bro. She needs prayer. When's the last time you prayed for your wife? When's the last time you prayed for your husband? Life is tough. It's, it's, it's a tough hour we live in. We need prayer. You pray for each other. How, how much are you investing in your marriage? When's the last time you went on a date? Say, for crying out loud, we do everything together. You know, but a date is not just doing things together. It's an on-purpose event in which you go out just to work on your marriage, your relationship. How long has it been since you had a good date? How long has it been since you held hands? How long has it been since you embarrassed your teenagers because they caught you kissing in the kitchen? How simple is this? Isn't it amazing how we get so distracted from the 
blessings of marriage. Marriage isn't just, all right, fine, we'll stay together. That's not God's plan. God wants you to enjoy it. If you're married, God wants you to be happily married. Blessed in your marriage. Victorious. So we're, we're talking about having victory at home. And, and let's talk then about pursuing a great marriage. Three words I'll give you, and uh, we'll go eat. How many of y'all like that? Three words. Can you handle three words? Uh, they only are like 50 minutes each, so we won't be here long. Uh, so three words, all right? Here's number one. Write this down somewhere. Number one, and uh, I'm going to let him throw it on the screen there for me. Number one is this. You got it? Responsibility. Now, I've already touched on that at the 930 hour, but some of y'all didn't come. So we got a review, okay? We got a review. See, some of you didn't, weren't here. You missed it. So we got a review. There is a responsibility in a marriage. And although the responsibility, sometimes we know, oh, my word, okay, I got to do this. But, but don't think of it that way. This is a foundation for your marriage. Husbands, here's a foundation for a happy, victorious, winning marriage. You got to learn to love and you got to learn to be a leader at home. You got to take the initiative. You got to love your wife. You got to say, you got to say things like, I love you. I, I preached at a camp many years ago to junior boys and girls. Now, if you've never worked with junior boys and girls, you might not know this, but junior boys and girls are different than teenagers and adults. Like I, I will, and, and pastor can tell you this, when you're preaching to adults, sometimes you will ask a rhetorical question or even a non-rhetorical question. You want a response and you can ask a question to adults and here's what they'll do. They'll go, and like the wheel's turning, but the hamster's dead. You know, it's just, it's just, there's just nothing going on. Teenagers are the same way. Teenagers, I have to really work to get them responding. Now, juniors, you don't. Juniors, you ask a rhetorical question. You weren't expecting an answer. They will give you one. That's how juniors are. So I was preaching to juniors. Now get this scene in your mind. And I was trying to keep them awake because it had been a very hot day. They had been playing all day, all kinds of events. And then we bring them out of 100% humidity in the state of Tennessee to an air-conditioned auditorium. They come in, they start calming down, and now they're kind of getting that, that look that some of you have right now that, you know, you know, he's preaching, but you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? And so you got to keep them awake. I'm trying to keep them awake. So I said this to those boys and girls. I said, now, boys and girls, we know that Jesus Christ loves his church because he showed it. And then I said, it's like your dad and mom. If they're married and they're happily married, the way your mom is going to know that your daddy loves her is if she shows it. And I said this question. Boys and girls, how could a husband show his wife he loves her? I wish you could have been there. <laughs> Boys and girls jumped up and down. I, I know, I know, I know. I got all kinds of answers. One kid, very simply, he had it. He nailed it. He said, he could tell her. Is it that simple? Sure it is. Hey, baby doll, snookums, I love you. Oh, sweetie pie, I love you. He says he could say it. One kid, and I lost all the juniors because juniors respond to things like this. One kid goes, he could kiss her. I'm like, that's, not a, that's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea at all. If it's been a while since you kissed real good, you ought to work at that. Beth and I read in a book one day that every married couple ought to have at least one kiss every day that lasts at least 15 seconds. Set the alarm. Y'all want to try it right now? That's like one, two, three. That's a long time. It'll change your life. And uh, so he said he could kiss her. There's one little boy up on the front row. Sir, he was sitting right where you are. And uh, I can still remember that little kid. He was just so calm. All the other kids are like, me, me, pick me, pick me. Not him. He was just like. And I thought this is going to be good. Little boy from Georgia. So I said, all right, son, you be the last one. What could a husband do to show his wife he loves her? The little guy goes, well, he could buy her some fried chicken. <laughs> and I thought, where did that come from? And I thought, reckon his mom has high cholesterol? Uh, what in the world? I don't know where that came from. But what could you do to show your wife you love her? It's our responsibility. See, it's, and it's on purpose. Just like Jesus, how do I know Jesus loves his church? My dear friend, if you came to Castle uh, View Baptist Church this morning and you don't know a lot about God, I can tell you without any doubt that Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins to show you he loved you. He did everything necessary for you to have eternal life. He showed it. And what you find in Ephesians 5 is that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and says, you want to have a great marriage? You got to show it. You got to show it. 
You got to work at the marriage. You got you got to invest. That's responsibility. You've got to lead. Men, you've got to take the initiative and lead at home. Set a budget. Take the lead. Take the lead in training the children. Take the lead in prayer at the table. Take the lead in making sure your family's in church. Don't put that pressure on your wife. You take the lead. Wives, it's your responsibility to partner and respect your husband. The Bible tells us that in Ephesians. I'm reviewing 9.30 hour. You've got to partner with him. Submission is a word, and it's such a negative word to so many people. But it just means to partner. It means it says, all right, honey, what are we going to do about this? You think it's what we ought to do? All right, let's do it together. That's submission. I'm on board. I'm on board. I'm on board with you. And, my, and I, I illustrated this, so forgive me that we're 9.30. But sometimes my wife will call me and she'll say something like this. Uh, and I'll be traveling somewhere in a meeting and she's home with the kids. And, and we're at a different stage right now. But when she had all five at home and was homeschooling them and life was busy, sometimes my wife would call me and she'd say, uh, hey, honey, your son. Y'all recognize that phrase? Your son did whatever. She'd name it. And then she would say this, what do you think I ought to do about it? Now, my wife's a brilliant lady. She's got a, she's got a college degree. She's, she, she, she taught in school and, and taught five kids, four of them, all the way through kindergarten to 12th grade. And they're all doing well. I mean, she did it well. This is a brilliant lady over here. She called me and said, what should I do? You know why? Because she was encouraging me to lead. And giving me the privilege of leading. That's an awesome thing, ladies, when you can partner with your husband like that. You put those two together. You put those responsibilities together and you can have a great marriage. You can win at home. Husband, you're not responsible for her. You can't make part. You, you can't make submission. You can't force. You can't force a husband to lead. It doesn't happen that way. But every husband in this room, you can love and work at leading no matter what your spouse does. And every wife can partner and respect her husband no matter what he does. You can, you can always work at it. But isn't it an amazing thing when you put those two together? Here's a man doing his responsibility. Here's a lady doing hers. And that is a happy marriage. How many of y'all want a happy one? Don't you? And I don't know if I've ever met anybody who is like, you know what, I just hope, I hope he's a real jerk after we get married. Nobody, nobody, nobody thinks that way. But sometimes we allow that to happen. Are y'all with me this morning? Am I making sense? So there's responsibility. Now here's a good one. Here is a good one. The second word is relationship. Look at the Bible here. The Bible says, for this cause a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. You know what that's talking about there? It's about relationship. Bethlehem's father was a pastor in, in Heath, Ohio for 47 years in the same church. He's in heaven now. And, and uh, my, uh, uh, my, my friend and my father-in-law and my pastor is in heaven now. And I said to Dad Dennis, every February for 47 years, Bethlehem's father dedicated the entire month of February to the home. He preached every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night on the family. Did that for 47 years, 47 series on the family. It was an amazing thing in our church, just incredible. So one day as I started preaching on the family, working on my own marriage and family, I said to Bethlehem's dad one afternoon, I said, hey, dad, I got a question for you. You counsel a lot of married couples. What do you think is the greatest problem in marriages? When you counsel, what is the greatest problem you find? What's the, what's the biggest issue when you counsel a couple? He did not even bat an eye or slow down. He said, they're not best friends. Kind of caught me off guard because normally dad didn't answer that way. I would ask my dad a question, Bethlehem's dad. I'd ask Papa a question. And, and, and when we'd ask Papa a question, when, I, when I'd say, uh, hey, hey, dad, uh, what do you think about? He would stop and he would... He would kind of roll his lips around. This was his thinking thing. And then he would say, well, you know, son, the Bible says, and he would always quote me the scripture. I loved that about him. The Bible says, well, this day, dad, what do you think is the greatest issue in marriages that you counsel in the church? And dad said, couples aren't best friends. Now, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life. Then I got to getting to know couples. And you know what? I think he was right. Are you and your husband best friends? You and your wife best friends? I mean, you pray for each other and pray together and love each other. I mean, just adore each other? Are you best friends? How many of you ever had a best friend that you don't even know now? How many of you back in high school had a best friend? You, were, you did everything together. You don't even know where they live. 
Best friends can just stop being best friends. You can draw, you can fall apart in your relationship. Am I right? I had a best friend in high school. I know where he lives, kinda. I couldn't find his house, but I don't know the town he lives in. I know he has two kids, but I don't know their names. I know he's married, but I don't know his wife's name. We were best buddies, and we spent every hour together when I was in high school. But we're no longer friends. I don't even know him, really. We connect periodically, maybe once every, you know, 20 years. And you're like, hey, I remember, you know, yeah, nice to see you. What was your name again? You know what I mean by that, right? So friendships can fall apart. The Bible says here, these two shall be one. How much time are you investing in your marriage? Are you best friends? How's that relationship? Are you working on it? I mean, you spend time together? You do stuff together? Do you laugh together? You know, there's a lot of issues in life. Learn to laugh, it'll help you. You just learn to laugh. Look for humor. Life is blessed. Life is great. Are you best friends? Friendship takes work. It takes time. It takes talking. How many of y'all notice that we live in a culture today that stares down all the time? How many of y'all know that? Went out to eat with Bethlehem. Trying to think where we were. In Knoxville, Tennessee, a few weeks ago, we went out to eat. We were in a family conference there, family revival. Beth and I went out to eat with the kids one afternoon. And, and uh, we're, we're, uh, it was actually just Charity, I guess, wasn't it? Just Charity was with us. We sit down at this table and we're eating. And this young couple came in. I, I don't know. I'm assuming they were married. They, uh, they came in and he sat in that seat just across the aisle from us there. And he sat in the seat over here and she sat over here. And, and when they sat down, he opened his phone, turned his phone on and never looked up. He looked up to order a drink. And he just kept staring at his phone. She sat across from him. And, and um, I, I'm at that age. I'm at that age where, you know, I, I got a soft spot for people my daughter's age. Not my, my Abigail. It's my little girl. And, and, and so she's about my daughter's age, maybe a little older. But I notice here, sir, you got a nice looking wife over there with you. Hell, hello. He never knew. He never looked at her. I just couldn't believe it. He just, just, he never looked up. He sat and looked at his phone, and, and, uh, and I thought, you know what would be really cool is if like, she just kind of quietly slid out of the seat and went out to the car and went home. <laughs> you know, at the end of the meal, he'd look up and go, where'd you go? And he'd text her, and she'd be like, oh, I'm home. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Wouldn't that be awesome? Well, why'd you go home? Well, you weren't talking to me. Now, honestly, we're living in a culture that's just like that. We go home, what do we do? Turn the TV on and stare at it. I heard one preacher say, at this rate, we're going to have brains the size of peas and eyes the size of plates. We're staring at screens. We don't talk anymore. I read somewhere recently that it takes at least seven minutes for a conversation to become meaningful. Married people think on that. It takes at least seven minutes for a conversation to become meaningful. I'm talking about deep. We've lost the art of how to have a sincere, deep conversation. The television's on. There's our distraction. The phone dings, rings, notifies. I was with a, with a young evangelist some weeks ago, and we were having a, a conversation that started to turn different. You know what I mean by that? You're just talking, you know, and we're just jacking. But all of a sudden, there's something. This conversation's taking a turn for deeper. We're going a little more meaningful. This is, this is no longer just two guys talking. This is a heart to heart. How I many y'all know what I mean by that? This is, this is a soul to soul. We're getting a little deeper. And, and all of a sudden, he was like, Excuse me, Brother Young. I, I need to answer this. Just excuse me. He's like, where, where were we? Well, I'll tell you where we were. We were leaving a meaningful conversation. Because we had to start over again. Now, I, I, I'm preaching from an iPad. So I'm not opposed to technology. How many of y'all thank God for technology? I don't, know where, I, don't know, I don't know how I'd find things if I didn't have a phone. Hey, Siri, take me to whatever. And Siri says, turn right. And I do. Well, one of these days, I'm going to wind up in the Atlantic Ocean. Because what Siri tells me to do, I do. How many of y'all know? You're, you're that way? Just, we turn. I, I have a friend who was supposed to come to a church in Roche, or Rochester Hills, Michigan. He was going to join me for a revival. He was a children's evangelist. I was the adults evangelist. And, and he was supposed to show up for dinner. Never showed up because he let Siri lead him astray. <laughs> Siri said, turn right. And he did. Said, turn left. He did. Said, turn right. He did. Found himself on the bridge to Canada. Wound up in Canada. 
And when he got to Canada, he said to the lady, I don't want to be here. She said, well, <laughs> welcome to Canada. He said, I got on the bridge by mistake. She said, fine, but you're in Canada. Welcome to Canada. She said, you got anything to declare? He's from Texas. Of course he did. <laughs> he had a nine millimeter pistol strapped to his ankle. Had a taser strapped on his belt and a spring loaded pocket knife. All three are illegal in Canada. He declared them. He was slightly detained. Isn't that a nice way of saying it? They finally let him go. The Canadian said, you can go back to Detroit and let them deal with you. Since you really didn't want to be here and since you declared that and we realized this is a mistake, we're going to let you go. And so they sent him back to Detroit and they said, hello, welcome to the United States. You got anything to declare? We found out the most amazing thing about Detroit, Michigan. His gun was legal because he had a right to carry. His taser is illegal. They confiscated it. And I got to thinking, boy, does that make sense? I could shoot you, but I just can't hurt you. That doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, I think that'd be the other way around. What in the world? But he managed to get, he, he was led astray. I thank God for technology. I love it. But don't you let technology hurt your marriage. Your marriage is more important than Facebook. Your marriage is more important than Instagram. Your, your marriage is, is more important than Marco Polo. Your marriage is more important than whatever app you come up with. We've got to work on having a relationship. Are you guys happily married? Relationship matters. Spend time together. Talk to each other. Beth and I, some years ago, we homeschooled every day. I, I, would, I would preach in chapels in the morning and in our revival campaigns. And then we're homeschooling five kids. And, and then um, we got revival at night. And, and, and the days were, every night we went to church, the days were crazy busy. And sometimes we'd come to the end of our day and be like, hey, do I know you? You know what I mean by that? Like, you know, we're married and yet... We've been with kids all day and revival and people and counseling and talking. So we started something years ago that has been a phenomenal help to our marriage. Every afternoon, somewhere between three and five, depending on, you know, the schedule, we stop everything, stop it all, put my notes away, put my Bible study notes away, put the homeschooling away, do everything, set it all down, we're done. And, and, and we make coffee or hot tea and, and uh, we sit for 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 minutes and just... We're just together. Just talk. How you doing? How's your day? All well? How are my kids? Do I need to kill anybody? Are we doing good? Are we okay? How are you investing in your marriage? The word is responsibility. That's Ephesians 5. The word is relationship. And I got one more. And this is my favorite. This sets every marriage. Your marriage is unique because of this word. It's the word romance. Listen to what he says. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they too shall be, what's the word? One. How many of y'all know that one plus one equals one? That's not common core. That's marriage. One plus one is one. You know what separates your marriage from all other relationships? See, Tate and I are good buddies. We're, we're very close friends. I'd say one of my best friends right there, your pastor, Tate Thronson. Yeah, we're best friends. There's no romance. We don't even do bromance. There's not even any bromance. Are y'all with me on that? There's only one person in the world that I can be romantic with. And that's the lady I married. It separates my marriage from all other relationships. Pastor Thompson and I can talk about all kinds of things, but, but Bethley and I, we have our responsibility, and if we work on our relationship, what the Bible wants you to know here is you can have romance, and that, that makes your marriage amazing. Did you know that romance is in the Bible? Did you all know that? This is one. Can I, can I read you something in the Bible? It's the Bible, so you all will believe it, right? How many of y'all believe the Bible? Do y'all believe the Bible? All right, let me read you something. We sometimes do family devotions through the book of Proverbs, and our children always love it when it's their turn to read these two verses. Solomon is talking to his son. You're going to love this. Gonna, if you've never read the book of Proverbs, then uh, buckle your seatbelt, because these are good, okay? Proverbs chapter 5. Listen to what Solomon says to his son. He said, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. All right? How many of you are married? Let me see your hand if you're married. All right. If you're married, you know what he says here, first of all, you ought to rejoice about being married. You ought to say, see that man over there? That's my man. See that guy? That's my man. See that lady over there? It's my baby doll. See those eyes of hers? 
I could dive in those and swim forever. That's a good line. You guys ought to write that down. <laughs> See? See, I, I mean, look, do, do you rejoice in being married? Here's what sometimes our culture is like this. Our culture is like, oh my word, the old lady I married. Stop it. Stop it. Don't you talk about your wife like that. Oh, it's my old man over there. No, 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 no. It's not your, it's your husband, it's your wife. So you ought to have a sweet, romantic marriage. You ought to be like, uh, see that guy right there? I like him. You guys got a desk? You got an office? And, and you got a desk at your work? Put a picture of you and your wife on there making out. <laughs> somebody comes in, somebody comes in, you got to do business with them. Say, look at, my, look at my baby doll right here. This is a woman of my dreams. See that lady right there? I love her. That's my wife. If you open my phone, you'll find a picture of me and my wife. That's, our, that's my screen. That's my wallpaper. Picture me because I'm in love. The Bible says you ought to rejoice. You ought to rejoice. Then listen to this. You ready for the next verse? This is so good. He says, uh, rejoice with the wife of your youth. And then he says, now, now be sacred because we're in church. He says, uh, let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times. And be thou ravished always with her love. Can you believe the Bible said that? <laughs> you know, our culture is like, oh my goodness, I can't believe he read that. We got kids in here, but you have a TV. That was, that was G compared to what the average kid sees on TV in one night. Are y'all with me on that? Right or wrong? Am I right or wrong? So don't be bothered by the word of God right here. What the Bible is telling us here, are you happily married? Here's some romance. You ought to be happily married. You ought to be satisfied in your spouse. And you ought to be ravished in your love. Don't allow, say this softly, gently, but mean it with all of my heart. Don't allow pornography to damage your romance. That stuff's evil. That'll destroy your thinking, darken your heart. It'll turn you dull spiritually. Don't let that in your life. Don't, don't buy the adulterous thinking of our generation. It's just an affair. No, it's not. It's adultery. It'll hurt your marriage. Don't you let some other lady take you with her eyes. Don't you let some guy build you up and make you think your husband's not worth your time. He says here, let her breast satisfy thee. It's the Bible way of saying we're to meet each other's needs. He says that in the Bible. God designed us, God designed us to be married and to, to marry each other in that way. That's what he did. Then he says this. He says you ought to be ravished in your love. That's a great word. And you know the problem with that word is it doesn't mean anything to y'all. Because I just read it and y'all looked at me. Be thou ravished always with her love. And y'all were like, you didn't even do that. You just looked at me because you didn't get the word. The word is ravished. And, and, and let me show you the word. All right? Everybody say the word ravished. Just say it. See, it didn't mean anything to you because you didn't feel it. Now, this is a Baptist church, right? It's a Baptist church. Baptists don't feel much. But uh, we, ought to, we ought to feel some things along the way. So you all ready to feel? Reach down in your heart and say that word right. Okay, you ready? You got to roll the R. Ravished. That's how you got to say it. That's a whole other word, isn't it? All right, try one more time. Roll the R if you can. What's the word? The word is ravished. Doesn't that mean more? I'd, I'd have you look at your spouse and say, I am ravished, but that might get out of hand. And uh, so we won't do that. So what's the Bible say right here? Solomon says to his son, be thou ravished always with her love. I looked up that word ravished and I like the word. You know what it means? It means intoxicated. It means, hey, baby doll, I am so in love with you that I am plum drunk. I'm just in love. I'm just drunk. I'm so in love with you. I'm drunk. It doesn't mean, if I was married to him, I'd drink too. It doesn't mean that. Are y'all with me on this? It means I love you. I'm madly in love with you. Hey, look at this. This is winning at home. You've got a God-given responsibility. Your responsibility is to love and lead men and to partner and respect, ladies. You've got an opportunity to have a best friend relationship. If you'll give it the time, if you'll learn to talk to each other, if you'll invest in your marriage, and you can have romance in your marriage. That's God's plan. Teenagers, 
Don't you get on Hollywood Entertainment and get the idea that if I just had a boyfriend, then I could have romance in my life. I'm just telling you, you won't find it in a dating relationship and you won't find it in moving in together and, and trying it out to see if you're compatible. You find genuine, biblical, amazing, wonderful, eternal romance inside the boundaries of a happy marriage. That's God's plan. And so he says, ah, oh, you know, come on, Brother Young. Listen, don't let this world, don't let this world destroy your marriage. Uh, read the Song of Solomon together. You ever read the Song of Solomon? It's a love poem about this couple that's madly in love. And I'm just telling you, he is so romantic in this Song of Solomon, it's crazy. Listen to what he says there. He says, behold thou, this chapter 4, behold thou art fair, my love, behold thou art fair. Thou hast doves' eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Boy, he really knew how to lay it on the line, didn't he? <laughs> Baby, when I see that hair of yours, it reminds me of a goat. <laughs> Well, there's a cultural meaning there because the goats in the evening time in, in that part of the world, they go up in the mountains and they would graze up there where, you know, where they could get food, certain foods, and the shepherds would bring them down in the evening. And the goats in that part of the world have really long flowing hair. And when you get two or 3,000 goats coming down the mountain in the sunset, looks like the mountain is moving. It's, it's captivating. Everybody stops to watch those goats coming down the mountain. And he says, uh, you know, that's a wow moment when we watch all those goats coming down. When I see your hair, it's a wow moment for me. That's pretty romantic, don't you think? And you ought to read this chapter. You ought to just read. He says, thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing, whereof every one bear twins. She had a whole set of teeth. <laughs> He's pretty happy about that. He says that thy lips are like a thread of scarlet. She is wearing red lipstick. Thy speech is comely. He liked to hear her talk. Thy temples are like a piece of a pomegranate within thy locks. I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> then he says in verse 4, Thy neck is like the tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. <laughs> she had quite a neck, didn't she? I was like, what in the world? He gets a little, little shady here. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountains of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. Thou art fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Thou hast ravished my heart, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes. Don't know what happened to the other one. Um, <laughs> How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse? How fair is thy love? Thy lips drop like a honeycomb. A garden enclosed is my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Spikenard and saffron and calamus and cinnamon and, and, and all the frankincense, the myrrhs and the altos, uh, aloes and the chief spices. You know what he's doing right here? He's saying, uh, I just want you to know I'm pursuing a little romance. He said it. How long has it been since y'all were romantic? I mean, you looked at her and said, uh, those eyes of yours, that neck of yours, reminds me of a tower of David. <laughs> that, that hair of yours just makes me think of a flock of goats. Now, we laugh at this, but I'll tell you what, she wasn't laughing. She was melting. It's romance. How y'all doing? It's a family conference Sunday. How y'all doing? How's your, are you winning at home? How are you doing with those responsibilities? How are you men doing? You leading? Are you in love? And does she know it? Are you showing it? How are you doing? Ladies, are you partnering with that man you married? Are you giving him the chance to lead? His brain doesn't work as fast as yours, so give him time. He's still trying to start the car when you're five miles down the road. So you got to let him lead. Got to slow down. Let him think it through. Give him, give him time. He, he, he works differently than you do. That's God's plan. God doesn't want him responding emotionally because you know when your husband responds emotionally, usually that's a negative. Am I with you on that? Are, are we making sense here? You don't want him responding emotionally. You want to give him time to think, to ask God, to pray for wisdom, to figure out what's the best course of action here. You can partner with him. You can talk to each other about it, but, but encourage him. Help me out here. I want our marriage to work. And God says you're to lead. Men, we got work to do. How many men agree with me on that? Ladies, you got to partner with him. Respect him. 
Find a reason today. I was doing some work at our house some months ago, and it was a busy day, and, and we weren't, we're not home very often. Normally, I'm in a place like this. Home is Milton, Florida, and we're rarely there. When I get home, there's a ton to do. And I was busy that day. I came running in the door, running in the door, stepped in the kitchen. And when I stepped into the kitchen, running in, stepped in the kitchen, my wife stopped me. She was at the kitchen counter, and she said, hey, honey. And I came to a halt. I'm, you know, my mind, I'm, I got work to do. I got to get her done. St- honey, and I stopped, and she said, hey, I just wanted to tell you, that I really appreciate all the work you do when we're home to make our house beautiful and our yard beautiful and take care of our cars. I just want you to know I really appreciate that. I I was just telling you, that was powerful. I came to a screeching halt and I was like, I'm the man. Like, want to make out, baby? I mean, want to smooch a little bit? I mean, this is good stuff. Now, see, we laugh at all that. We're like, I can't believe he said that in church. See how oh, that's biblical. Shame on us that we've allowed the crazy, busy world we live in to distract us from winning at home. You can have a sweet marriage. You need help? Well, you can get it. Got some issues you don't know how to handle? Then get help. Cry out to God this morning and let him encourage your marriage and strengthen your marriage. Some of you are widows, maybe a widower. Pray fervently for your kids and grandkids. They need your prayers. Some of you teenagers, it's going to be a few years before you find a husband or a wife, but you ought to be praying about it now. Ask God, God, give me a good husband, give me a good wife so that I can have what Brother Dave preached about today. This is God's plan. I don't know most of you if there's any chance at all that you saw the sign or looked it up online or had a friend invite you and you showed up today, you probably didn't come to church expecting to hear this message. But there is a message you need to hear that's more important than even this one. And that is that there's a real God who loves you so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die for your sins, to be buried, and to be raised from the dead. The reason the Son of God died for our sins is that so that through Him we could be forgiven of all our sins. And the reason that He was raised from the dead is so that through Him we could have eternal life, abundant life, spiritual life, everlasting life. The wonderful news of the Bible is that although we're sinners separated from a perfect God who designed us and created us, He wants a relationship with us. And if I will turn to his son, Jesus Christ, and believe on him and trust him and receive him as my God and my Savior, the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, will move into my heart and life. He will forgive my sins and give me everlasting life. And he actually will move into my life and help me, lead me, guide me, direct me. You know, I can't win at home by myself. I'm going to blow it every time. But I have a God in my life who's given me his word, his church, a pastor, friends to help me. And the most incredible victory you will ever see is at home. Don't you want to win at home? I hope so. I'm going to pray. And then Pastor Thronson, I'm going to let you come and conclude. Father, Lord, I love teaching on marriage and family. Lord, I, I want Bethley and me to win at home, to never get over the fact that we are married and we have responsibilities and we can have a best friend relationship and we can have romance and we can enjoy marriage all the days of our lives. I pray for singles in this room that they will be content and they'll serve you in their singleness. I pray for those who have lost a husband or a wife and they know what it is to have a lonely heart. But encourage them today that they, they can have a ministry of prayer and encouragement to others who, who, who need help, who need strength. And dear Father, if there's anybody seated in the auditorium this morning who is not yet on their way to heaven, would you draw them to Jesus Christ? 
Would you help them to receive him as Savior and God? Would you help them to be born again? Help all of us to win at home. In Jesus' name. Thanks again for joining us online. If you have questions about the message or Castleview Baptist Church, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us through email, check us out on our website, or visit social media for the latest news. Thanks for watching. Thank you.